out of here. We're not going to hold you long today. We got we got the Rams playing, the 49ers, and Kansas City. Who are, who's Kansas City playing? Yeah. Kansas City playing Cincinnati. Oh, we got a, we got a, at least three out of four teams that we got a vested interest in. So, all right. Well, we're going to go ahead and jump into this word, everybody. Jesus from the beginning. And as you know, our home scripture for this series has been Luke, the 24th chapter, the 25th through the 27th verse. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the, that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. That took place on what we call the Emmaus Road, where Jesus met up with a couple of his disciples after he had rose again. And they didn't recognize him because the Lord had allowed him to hide his, his identity and then they were talking about, didn't you hear about everything that happened? And they were sad and everything. He said, well, it was supposed to happen, you know. And so then he started to unfold the scriptures. And what we've been on is a journey through all the prophecies that were spoken in the Old Testament and revealed in the New Testament. You know, I often have said that folks say, oh, you don't need the Old Testament. We're New Testament believers. And I say, well, that was Jesus' Bible, and it's often quoted in the New Testament exactly what came from the Old. And then you will have those who will say, well, the New Testament, you know, that's not really, you know, what, what we're supposed to study. We're supposed to study the Old Testament. And I said, well, you need the whole counsel of the Word, because the Old Testament contains Jesus Christ uh, concealed, and the New Testament is Jesus Christ revealed. So one was the first agreement. The second one is the new agreement or testament, you know. And so therefore, you need it all. You need it all. You need to understand how it's interconnected, how one was spoken and how the other fulfilled was fulfilled through Christ Jesus. So we've looked at over the last few weeks, uh, Jesus' birth as it was prophesied and fulfilled in the old to the new, his ministry, his death and resurrection. And today we're going to look at his role in the church, Jesus's role in the church. And so we, we, don't, we don't have that many this week. It's going to be a shortened verse and us, uh, verse of scriptures. And so I know you're thankful for that, that since it's a big game day. And then we're going to finish up with just a few brief um. Uh, mentions when I talked about themes and types of Jesus uh, so that you can also have another way beyond just the prophecies. There's another way that you can see Jesus in the Old Testament. So first of all, it says God will raise up a prophet like Moses. God will raise up a prophet like Moses. That Well, that was the first prophecy. And that came from Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, the 15th through the 16th verse. The prophecy reads as thus. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him, for this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see his great fire anymore, or we will die. So they were just intimidated by the presence. They knew they weren't right. None of us are. And so to be in the presence of God, there were times that if you looked onto the Lord's face, that you would be consumed because of his, because of his holiness and his greatness. He is the great I am. And they was like, it's too much to bear. Even when Moses was in the presence of God, he, he was like, he, he, he turned white. That's what the, that's what, um, uh, Hollywood show that his image show white, but the glory of the, of the Lord was upon him so much. They didn't even want to look at Moses face because the, the, the glory of the Lord was so bright, shined so bright. They couldn't take it because of the impurity that was in them. So the fulfillment of this scripture is spoken from John, the fifth chapter, the 45th through the 47th verse. And it says, but do not think I will accuse you before the father. Your accuser is Moses, of whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what, the, what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? 
Hmm. Jesus called them out, didn't he? He was more, I didn't read this in detail, but I believe this is where he was probably calling out either the Pharisees or the Sadducees, okay? He, he would call them vipers and everything else because he would call them out for their religiosity, right? He's like, you got me right here in front of you. You asked for this and you still don't believe, okay? And so this is kind of where it was fulfilled or it, where it was, not kind of, it was fulfilled in John 5, 45 through 47. He is calling out that very situation that was spoken of in Deuteronomy. It also says God will raise up a faithful priest who does God's will. Now, I know we often talk about, and it's not, this is not one of the scriptures, but Malachi Malachi 1 through 3, those were some unfaithful priests who were not doing the God, doing God's will. That's where the whole can a man rob God comes from. Malachi or those priests who were stealing, they were skimming off the top, okay? That's what was happening in Malachi. So that's one example of some priests who were not being faithful, okay? They were not doing the right thing. 1 Samuel 2 and 35, it says, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart, and mind, I will firmly establish his priestly house, and they will minister before my my anointed one, uh, my anointed one always. Okay, that was fulfilled. Hebrews two and seventeen. It says, "For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful." and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. So this is why Jesus was what? A hundred percent man. And then I just say, when I open up in prayer, we have not a high priest who has not been touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was flesh. He was man. He was just like you and I in the flesh. He lived in our existence and in our circumstance. He understood what it was to be rejected and to be sad and to, and to be uh, 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 angry and every emotion that we could possibly go through, yet he did it without sin. He was that high priest who lived among us, who could be the atonement for us because he did not sin. Amen? All right. It says the Messiah will judge the world justly. The Messiah will judge the world justly justly the prophecy is spoken out of psalm the ninth chapter the seventh through the tenth verse again here we are in psalm psalm is all about prophecies about jesus and then it's fulfilled here spoken in Acts 17 31 it says the lord reigns forever he has established his throne for judgment he rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity the lord is a refuge for the oppressed a stronghold in times of trouble those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. That's a good one. You make sure you mark that one down. Psalm 9, 9 7 through 10. And then in Acts, 9, uh, Acts 17, 31, it says, For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So whatever Jesus said he was going to do, whatever the prophet said Jesus was going to do, he did it. It was fulfilled right here in scripture. And so where it talks about him being a refuge for the oppressed, uh, a stronghold in times of trouble, someone we can trust. Why can we trust him and we can't trust other prophets? Because they still in the grave. Okay. They, they, they still, they, not, none of them can say that they rose again. They can't clean us up. They can't atone for us. Only the blood of Jesus could do that. And that's why we can trust in him. He did something that no other man was capable of doing. The Messiah will have all authority over judgment. And this comes from Isaiah, the 22nd chapter, 22nd verse. I will place on his shoulders the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. And then the fulfillment to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. That is from Revelation, the third chapter, 
through the seventh, the seventh verse. And I said Jesus from the beginning. Jesus from the beginning to the end. He quoted in Genesis and he quoted in Revelation from beginning to end. It's all about Jesus. We can't throw out any of it. It's all because it's one's quoting the other. Amen. It's all good for, for, his, for, the, for his children. It's all good for us. And so we just have to understand what, what is it pointing us to? It's all pointing us to Jesus. Amen. We're, and now they were in a position looking for him to come. And guess what? So are we. So are we. And when we read those stories in Revelation, when we've been through it, Pastor Petaway walked us through Revelation. And it's almost like cookie cutter of the children of Israel and their unrighteousness and their stumbles and their falls. And we see the same kinds of activities in the people in Revelation who are there after, you know, the, the uh, what we call the rapture and uh, the tribulation and things of that nature is very reminiscent of some of the, the things that happen in the books of Genesis. Amen? It's very reminiscent of that. All right. So the Messiah will pour out his spirit. This is Isaiah 44 and 3. For I will pour out, pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offering and my blessing on your descendants. And then we have here John, the 16th chapter, the seventh verse is the fulfillment of that scripture. But verily, truly, or very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And that's John, the 16th verse and the seventh uh, 16th chapter, the seventh verse. And what do we say of the Holy Spirit? It says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Again, we see the connection of the Old Testament where it was prophesied and the New Testament where it was fulfilled. This is one of actually several scriptures that talks about the power of the Holy Spirit and him pouring out his spirit on all flesh. Again, it's all interconnected. It also says the Messiah will usher in a new covenant. So we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And what does the word testament means? It means covenant. So the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. That's why we have two covenants. One was old, one was new. One was the, was the, the hidden and concealed covenant of Jesus Christ. And one is the revealed covenant or testament of Jesus Christ. Testimony. Okay. Jeremiah 31 and 31 says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. And where did Christ come from? They said he was what? The lion of Judah, the seed of Israel. Here we have, it says here, Matthew 26 and 26. It says, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Uh, for the forgiveness of sins. Again, for the forgiveness of sins. That is Matthew 26 and 26. That's that new covenant that we live under. We are new covenant creatures. We are new covenant saints. But does it mean that we completely abolish and just erase out everything in the old covenant? It's kind of, point, it's the old covenant pointed us to the new. And so we have to reference it, cross-reference it to understand one was what? Again, I say Christ concealed. One is Christ revealed. It's the fulfillment of what everything was spoken in that new covenant or the old covenant. And that one is our final prophecy from the Old Testament scriptures that was revealed in the New Testament. One writer states that Jesus isn't absent in the Old Testament, but he unites the old with the new. He unites the old with the new. That's why I say, don't throw away Jesus' Bible. Don't, don't throw away what he was quoting from. It is needed. It's necessary for our understanding to see and trust that what they said was going to happen will. And if we can trust what happened then to what happened when he came here and he lived among us and he died and he rose again, then certainly we can trust the prophecy that says he's coming back again. Amen. We can trust when he says, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age, that it's happened. He said it. We can trust it. We can rely on it. 
That's why it's good to read the word of God. It's good to get an understanding of his message because it encourages you. It strengthens you. It gives you hope. It gives you peace. Amen. It says the prophets saw it before it occurred in the Old Testament and it was fulfilled in the new. And so we have some, we have a prophecy that we're yet waiting to be revealed. And that's the, G, the return of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In addition to the promises of the prophets, if we look very closely, we can understand and see scriptures and show patterns of Jesus Christ as well as his presence in the Old Testament. This is where I start talking about the themes and types of Jesus. So we see his pat patterns of Jesus in the Old Testament. We see his actual presence where he shows up in the Old Testament. Again, we talked about our seminary students talk about types and themes of Christ. Consider old Moses. Moses was a deliverer. He was a type of Christ because he delivered the people. Okay, and so then you also see reoccurring themes in the Bible. One is the, the younger will be blessed beyond or greater than the older. We look at Christ compared to Adam. You'll hear people refer to Christ as the last Adam, where you had Adam was the first Adam, or Christ was either the second or the last Adam, or looking at David. When you look at David, and it talks about him, that Christ was there before him and after him. And you're just like, how is all this connected? We see births of um, the twins who one, um, and I, I forget their names, if so forgive me, but they were twins and one held the foot of the other one. And the younger brother was more prominent than the other one. One sold his birthright. Forget names. When you're up here preaching, you forget names at times, but y'all know what I'm talking about, that Bible study story. But that's, again, another example of the younger coming up and having prominence over the older. So that is a theme, a reoccurring theme that happens in the Old Testament. And when you see those things, just think, oh, this is an example of Christ showing up. Here are some other things, such as the, the stories of the flood and the ark, stories about the Passover, the Red Sea, the wilderness and the promised land, the exile, the return, war and peace, kingdom and kings, prophets and priests, the temple. There's so much when you look at the temple, even the materials in the temple that points us to Christ. The holies of holies, the, um, the crucifixion itself when, and this is even though it's New Testament, but during the crucifixion, it talks about the, the, uh, the curtain being ripped from top to bottom. That is earmarked are, 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 are identical to the old um, uh, 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 temple structure when there was a, a, a curtain that hid the holies of holies. Now that was torn. So that's, that's taking away that distance from God to his people where there was distance and there was uh, no access in the temple. But now with Christ's um, uh, crucifixion, now he removed that distance and we have direct access to Christ or to God because of what Jesus Christ did. Other things such as the sacrifices and the rituals. So Christ was the perfect sacrifice. That's why Jews don't do sacrifices anymore. Wisdom in death and in life. Songs of lament and rejoicing. The lives of faithful sufferers and the blood uh, of righteous martyrs all point us to Jesus. OK, so everything that you see, all those examples in the Old Testament point us to Jesus. That's why we say Christ is concealed in the mysteries of God's word for those who don't believe. There are some people can read. You can read everything about Christ is telling you about Christ, but they don't see it that way. Or they think there's another Messiah that's yet to come. Additionally, Christ shows up as the great I am in so many other familiar places in scripture. The son of man, you'll hear him referred to as the son of man. And one looks like the son of man. Remember the fiery furnace? And they talked about and there was a fourth man in that fiery furnace and it looked like the son of God. Who are they talking about? Jesus, the ram in the bush. Other items that show up. Jesus was what? He's a male ram, perfect sacrifice, right? So that was a type or a theme of Jesus. No matter where you look in the Bible, you will find Jesus. He is always present from the very beginning to the end. 
I went from Genesis, as my mama would say, Genesis, to Revelation. Okay? He's in there. She would say that too. He's in there. <laughs> and the good news is that he isn't bound to just the pages of the scripture. Yes, it's not just some in ancient literary, literary work that's a dead work. The word of God is alive. The word of God lives within us. The word of God is Jesus Christ. And what? He is truly alive today. And he's what? Coming back again. If there's any reason that he's hidden in your life and you don't seem to see Jesus, you can't seem to find him. Dig in a little closer. Get a little deeper. Get a little deeper in your word. Turn the radio down. Turn the radio down. Turn Jesus up. Fast and pray. Consecrate some time to get to know him a little bit more. You will see him. You will be revealed. He will be revealed in your life. He might be concealed right now. You might not be able to hear him. You might not be able to see him. But guess what? The closer you get to him, the more you pursue him, he will pursue you. If you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. He is there and he always has been and he always will be until the end of the age. He is working in the church just as scripture has prophesied and fulfilled and he is working in our lives today until his triumphant return. Let us pray. Father, we again thank you for being able to go through scripture and go on our own little Emmaus walk. Whether it was a prophecy that we saw and read of the fulfillment in the New Testament, whether it was a theme or a type or a pattern that we saw, we learned how we can investigate scripture and see you more clear clearly. Let us also be able to do the same things in our lives. Let us look back and see how Christ showed up and showed out. Continue to draw near to us as we draw near to you. And we thank you in advance for how you'll continuously bless. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Bless God. Bless God. All right. <laughs>